The number one irrigated crop in America is not corn, it's not soy, it's not high quality educational YouTube content, it is, in fact, grass. A crop we cannot eat, that cannot support an ecosystem, and frankly, doesn't even look that cool. Now, that might not sound too shocking to you. Grass is everywhere. It's natural. When you boot up a new Minecraft world, you'll be met with thousands and thousands of blocks of grass. That's how nature works, right? Well, no. At least not on this continent. In fact, pretty much all of the grass covering the United States wasn't there a few hundred years ago. Our obsession with this little green plant was a choice, and the iconic American lawn is actually a fairly new invention. But how did grass become the default plant of the American suburb, and why do we spend billions of dollars and millions of acres farming a crop that doesn't actually do anything? Well, now that you're locked into watching an educational video essay about grass, let's start by talking about something that's not grass. Cannibalism. When Europeans first came to America, their plan was simple. Find whoever was already there, give them smallpox, and then rely on them for food supplies for the next several decades. This didn't work, and within two years, the Europeans had resorted to eating each other. The taste of settler got old quickly, and they started importing livestock. The problem with this second plan was the same as the first plan, though. There was still nothing to eat. Most of the native grasses in New England, like broom sedge or switchgrass, would only grow in warmer months, and the cows would basically drive them to extinction, bringing all the cows with them, and then all the settlers again. So the American colonies were really only able to stabilize after the import of foreign grasses like perennial ryegrass, Bermuda grass, and Kentucky bluegrass. Yes, that's right, Kentucky bluegrass is from Algeria. That state had exactly one thing going for it, and it was a lie. Now, that explains how modern grass got here, but doesn't explain why 80% of American homeowners have a useless empty square of it sitting in front of their house. And to explain where that came from, and why a bizarre number of people are still legally bound to keep that square alive, is a little more complicated. When America first started to urbanize, homes were built European style, close to the street with private gardens in the back and cigarette smoking children in the front. But as long distance trains became increasingly popular and started to bring people outside their immediate town or city, neighborhoods needed a way to signal to wealthy traveling outsiders that they were high status areas, and one of the easiest ways to do this was with lawns. Why? Well, because the only way to make grass grow back then was to throw money at it. Not literally, but you know, it was expensive. In most parts of the country, these foreign grasses weren't necessarily built to survive, and there weren't pesticides or chemical fertilizers to keep them alive. Maintaining a healthy lawn of Kentucky bluegrass required constant replanting and around-the-clock maintenance, both clear signals of wealth. Basically, grass became popular because of how bad it was. If you could defy nature for no reason other than to tell people you were rich, you were probably rich. But then things got weirder. Over here in Long Island, New York, a guy named William Levitt founded a town called Levittown around the beginning of the 1950s. There was an ongoing affordable housing crisis, and Levitt had set out to solve it. He created an assembly line construction method for building a suburb, putting up a brand new identical house roughly every 16 minutes, and each and every house came with a lawn. Now, this was partly to make these homes seem more deluxe than they actually were, and managed to distract people from the fact that Levittown didn't, for example, have basic plumbing, but it was also bizarrely a political move. Lawns, it turns out, are a weirdly good tool for social control. Levitt distributed strict pamphlets on lawn care to every single resident and placed a covenant in their deeds that required them to mow their lawns at least once a week between the months of April and November. If they failed to do so, he would have their lawns cut and charge them for it. If that sounds creepy and conformist, that was exactly the idea. Levitt wanted to convince the government that his suburb was keeping people in line because they were subsidizing all of his housing and essentially letting him rewrite whatever zoning codes he wanted. The idea was, if you were busy enough mowing your lawn, you wouldn't have time to read Das Kapital. That's not even a joke. It sounds like a joke, but that's literally what they thought would happen, and they were basically right. Given the success of Levittown, it became the blueprint for new affordable suburbs all over the country, and the creepy anti-communist grass stuff came baked right in. Homeowners associations, which all started popping up a few years after Levittown to privately manage suburbs around the country, still enforce many of the same sorts of regulations that Levitt put into place, which is why we still go around arresting people for letting their grass grow wrong, even though we can't even remember why we cared about that in the first place. So there you go. The reason your parents have a small patch of this particular plant in front of their house is because 200 years ago this plant was really hard to maintain, which turned it into a status symbol, which was used to lure boomers into horrible factory houses with no plumbing, which were in turn used to distract them from learning what the phrase means of production meant. Mystery solved. But here's another mystery. How do you cook for one person without wasting a huge amount of food and money? Well, the answer to that mystery is simple. Hello Fresh. I gave up on groceries years ago. I hated schlepping to the grocery store, flipping through recipes I wasn't even sure would be good, wasting my whole evening preparing the meal, and throwing out half of the ingredients I bought at the end of the night. It was bad for me, and it was bad for the environment, but HelloFresh saved me from all of that. 
The concept is pretty simple. You select which meals you want on their app, then the next week, an insulated box shows up on your doorstep with all the ingredients you need to make those meals already measured out and prepped. Then, in 30 or so minutes, you've got an awesome, hassle-free, home-cooked meal like this crispy buffalo spice chicken with scallion mashed potatoes and roasted carrots. I've been using HelloFresh since 2020 and have these hundreds of recipe cards to prove it. They've made it so much easier for me to eat healthier, cook faster, and spend less, and I've gotten better at cooking too. So I'd encourage you to try out HelloFresh. Just click the button on screen or go to HelloFresh.com and use code HAI60 for 60% off plus free shipping.